Any mode. Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to today's webinar. Welcome back to the ACNC webinar program after a, a bit of a break. Um, we've missed the opportunity to connect with you uh, through our webinars. We hope you're all well, hope you're all staying safe. Um, we hope that today's webinar can help you and your charity through some pretty extraordinary times. Um, today, we're going to be looking at how charities um, can step forward uh, in financial management, money management, uh, and, and that sort of thing in the in the changed circumstances that have been brought about by, by COVID-19. My name's Chris Richards, I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me today is Mel Yates, the ACNC's Director of Reporting and Red Tape Production. Hi, Mel. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Cool, we're all connected. This is wonderful. As you can guess, we are operating remotely, so um, we may have some interesting background noises as we go along. Um, if that's the case, be entertained and, and bear with us. Um, before we start, some very quick housekeeping points. If you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, uh, you can try listening through your phone, call the number listed in the email you have received upon sign up and put in the access code, listen to the webinar that way. Um, we have the ability to uh, take your questions um, as you wish to type them in as we go. Um, we have Maggie and Matt uh, who are going to be uh, looking to respond to those questions. So feel free to uh, send them through uh, as we go and we'll get some responses through to you uh, where we can. Uh, we'll try and answer all the questions as they come through. If we can't, um, what we'll do is uh, if you want to send us an email through to education at acnc.gov.au, we'll get back in touch with you. Recording of this webinar, uh, as well as the presentation slides, they'll be published on the ACNC website uh, as soon as we can do so, um, hopefully in the next couple of days. Um, as always, we'll send out an email with the links featured in this webinar so you don't have to write everything down. Uh, we've also included a list of uh, useful websites and reference points um, in the handouts uh, that accompany this webinar. Uh, final thing, we really uh, value your feedback. If you have any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know. Um, so, onto, onto things, he says, hitting a button. There we go. Uh, look, this is what we're going to cover today. Webinar is going to be split into some different parts. The first part is going to be a little bit of context, uh, a little bit of reference for where things are at. Um, the main body of the webinar is going to be devoted to obviously charity money management uh, and its components. Uh, some of the things we're going to be covering include uh, charity forecasting and, and planning, um, charity spending, um, some good practices there, um, including issues like fundraising, the use of charity reserves. Uh, Mel, we've also got a couple of other, other things we're going to look at too. We do. So we want to focus a bit of time on meetings and decision making and some of the things that you need to think about there which are very important. We'll also talk about charity reporting, including some tips and things to remember about your charity's reporting. And I guess as part of all of this, um, expectations and responsibilities of registered charities and what they need to think about in relation to their registration with the ACNC, that's what we'll try and focus on. We're also going to move through some tips, as I said, some reminders and some things that charities really should be thinking about at this time, particularly in terms of money management, as charities might be entering a new financial year. And obviously, charities are currently going through the AGM season as well. Now, just, I guess, to start with some context, because um, clearly, um, we, we know there's been an impact on charities um, relating to COVID-19. Um, many of you will be feeling those impacts directly, uh, some indirectly. Um, some of these impacts uh, have been on obviously charities' actual work. Um, some of that work's been impacted or even curtailed due to you know, physical distancing measures, um, isolation related uh, limitations, those sorts of things. Uh, at the same time, many charities have also seen an increase in demand on their services um, as the impact of COVID has been has been felt. There's been impacts on fundraising activities. Um, clearly, face-to-face -face fundraising has been hit hard. Um, with that, I guess, fundraising staple out of bounds, many charities' liquidity has been affected. Um, some charities have had to make some decisions, some 
alterations uh, to shore up their financial position. They've embraced new fundraising methods, we've sought out funding from alternative sources, they've used reserves. Um, some charities have even decided to just call a bit of a halt to their programs or have even gone into a little bit of a recess just, just for now as well. Um, another impact has been on charity staff and volunteering. Uh, there's been issues obviously in relation to staff, um, volunteering situation has again been impacted. Um, organizers, organizations are facing challenges in uh, attracting, uh, engaging and, and retaining volunteers uh, as well. So there's some of the contexts. Um, as uh, the next couple of slides look at where, where there's a, been a couple of uh, recent surveys about some of the impacts that, that charities have felt. Um, now let's see, we've got this one here. Uh, and Mel, if you wanted to uh, just take us through that one. Yeah. Thank you. I guess combining no all of this together, uh, it's yeah. not surprising that there's a lot of anxiety, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of fear amongst the charity sector. So a recent survey of Australian community and not-for-profit sector groups, which coincided with the Giving Tuesday Now period a bit earlier in the year, found mm. that 33% of organisations believe that COVID-19 poses a significant threat to their ongoing viability. 53% describe post-pandemic future as uncertain and 14% describe their future state as weaker. And there's more on that survey available at the website which has been included or will be included in the materials that are circulated. Indeed, yeah, it's the Institute of Communities, Community Directors uh, Australia website. So um, uh, go have a look at the, the links there and, and have a bit of a look around there. Um, as well as Australian impacts, obviously overseas, um, charities have felt it. Um, in the UK, story has been uh, pretty similar. Um, there's been a number of surveys of the sector over the past, uh, past months. Um, 90% of charities expected to receive less income than forecasted over the next six months. Um, many expected COVID to have a negative impact on their ability to meet charity objectives across that, that similar time frame. Many charities also uh, reported um, you know, noticeable and even substantial losses to their, to their total income. 80% um, of small charities have had to alter or, or drop services. Um, now look, we've, as you probably know, I know we mentioned it in our, in our last webinar before we took a bit of a break, we've got uh, our page here, our COVID-19 page, um, that's been constantly updated on our website. Um, there's a lot of information on there. As a first port of call, we would probably recommend that you can have a look at that. There's all manner of links and all manner of um, uh relevant uh bits and pieces to help your charity so that's www.acnc.gov.au forward slash covid19 um yeah take um take some time to refer to that book market uh all of that sort of stuff so some contexts uh mel if you uh, if if you wish thank you very much chris so I guess we're now going to start going through in a bit more detail some of the considerations that your charity really should be thinking about at this time. Many of these are financial considerations, some are operational, some are reporting, but they're just a series of things to think about in terms of your own charity. Now, the majority of charities have just started a new financial year on the 1st of Ju July. And also we've got the AGM season currently being uh, progressed by many organisations across the sector as well. And we've got reporting mm -hmm. responsibilities falling due. So really now's the time to, I guess, jump into it. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, um, now these times obviously you know, at any stage, um, the importance of charity leadership um, is, is, uh, is you know, a, a constant, I guess, factor and a constant topic. But at these times, it becomes uh, extra important, I suppose. Um, look, we, we would perhaps say that, you know, good charity leadership maybe has not been more important in recent times. Um, Australia's charity sector is vibrant obviously um, it's innovative uh, it moves it's it's agile um, there's always been a, a, 
I guess, a, a willingness to try new things to get the job done. Um, much of this attitude does start at the top with leaders um, and times like these require, I guess, reliable and, and innovative leadership. This is where you as charity leaders come in. So this is our first sort of message here, I guess. During times like these, charity leaders really have a role to, to step up, um, to think about the information um, of, available to them, not only from the ACNC, but from other good sources as well. And to ensure that the learnings that, that they have today, two weeks ago, two weeks into the future, um, those sorts of things are, are implemented uh, in, in their charities. Thanks, Chris. So thinking about all of these things, there's one really key message that is very important that charities and particularly responsible persons, their leaders, such as yourselves, need to take into account. And that is at the top of this slide. The best interests of the charity must always be paramount and at the forefront of all decision making. Now, when you're thinking about what your next steps might be, what you need to do, how to move forward, your starting point must always be what is in the charity's best interests. That's a key part of any responsible person's role as defined by the ACNC Act, and it's a requirement of the ACNC. In, yeah, in, indeed it is. Um, now, when you're working through these issues um, and, and some of the things that we're going to talk about today, your charities and the responsible persons are going to quite obviously face some balancing acts, some trade-offs. Um, some of them you might already be familiar with. We've got a couple here on screen. Um, you know, the immediate needs uh, and short-term interests versus the longer-term ones, um, sort of balancing them and the challenges that brings. Um, the reduction in expenditure versus, you know, the continuing continuation of, of uh, delivering outcomes for, for those that you aim to work with or help. Um, and that's not just now, obviously, that's that's into the future as well. Um, the front of mind points here, I guess, are that you, you need to think about whether the decisions you are making are in line with your charity's purposes and they're in line and, and they mesh with your charity's governing document. Um, now, how can you do this? How can this occur? Mel? Great. So what does it mean to act in the best interests of the charity? So some practical ways that this can happen and you can demonstrate that you are always thinking about the charity first and foremost is documenting any decisions that are made by the charity, decisions that are made by responsible persons. Make sure you keep records of all of these decisions and I should underline that keeping records is a requirement, both yeah. operational records but also financial records. And making sure that financial information and regular financial information is made available to people that are making decisions. So it's really important that responsible persons have the information they need so that they can make decisions that are in the best interests of the charity. So if you are a responsible person and you need more information, then it's really important that you speak up and ask for that. Yeah, definitely. And don't be afraid of speaking up. Um, seek the advice and seek the guidance um, that's out there uh, that, that you need to ensure that you're doing the job and you're doing the job to, to I guess, uphold the best interests of the, of the charity that you are, you are a part of. Um, look, we, we briefly touched on, I guess, elements of forecasting when looking at some of the sector survey results just a few slides ago. Um, when we talk about forecasting, and this is something that we're going to devote a, a little bit of time to, what are we actually, I guess, what is our actual meaning here, Mel? Sure. So when we talk about forecasting, really what we're doing is we're trying to understand our cash flows. Where are we going to get money from and what do we need to spend money on to keep our charity operating? 
So it's really about making sure that you are thinking about the charity, you're preparing the charity to understand what the future is likely to look like in terms of any revenue coming in. And it's a really good process to think about really what what's likely to happen, but also in this time of uncertainty, it's probably really sensible to think about a worst case scenario. So be quite conservative if you're wondering whether you're going to receive perhaps donations or revenue from particular sources, but you're very unsure, then it might be worthwhile doing some forecasting on the basis that you don't think you will receive those donations to see how the charity will cope uh, and what that actually means for the organisation. Yeah, now we're going to, as I mentioned before, we're going to spend a, a little bit of time here looking at forecasting simply because it is a, a, a key component in terms of um, financial planning and, and, and the management of your finances during challenging times like these. So we, we've, we've just, uh, Mel's just mentioned briefly, uh, you know, forecasting realistically and perhaps even conservatively. What are some of the things that that does encompass, Mel? Sure. So really thinking about the sources of revenue. So where does the charity receive revenue from, whether that be donations, whether that be from government, whether that be from investments or from many other sources. So really understanding where the money that comes into the charity, where that comes from and the reliability of those sources of revenue. It might be it might be of assistance to look at historical information. There might be insights that you can get from looking at what happened last year or the year before, but it's also really important, as I said, to be realistic. So even though you may have received a donation from a community business or from an organisation um, within your, your local area, think about the impact that COVID-19 is perhaps having on those other businesses. They might not be in a position to provide that donation at the moment. So what does that mean for your charity? So thinking about the economic consequences of COVID to your organisation, but thinking broadly because the sources of revenue might be impacted with what's currently going on. There's also a really important uh, consideration here is thinking about any programs of assistance, whether that's from government or other organisations to assist the charity. So there's been a lot of talk about economic stimulus and your charity may be entitled to some sort of benefit or assistance through one of those programs. And I guess the last point, health considerations. I think this is really important because there may be issues around either volunteers who would normally help your charity that mm. are unable to participate in any volunteering at the moment because of the physical distancing measures that are in place or because they're vulnerable. So yeah. it's also thinking about the impact that that might have on the ability of the charity to earn income or deliver any services. Yeah, and I, I, I guess when we're talking about um, this this sort of thing, um, you know, mindset is, is important here um, when, when you're forecasting, oh, mindset's important with a lot of things, but mindset's important with, with forecasting and that sort of stuff. Obviously, we've discussed thinking about a more conservative approach on, on money and spending. Uh, what necessary changes does your charity need to make to accommodate the current situation? Um, and the situation might be ongoing for a little while still. Um, an example might be just simply not committing to any more expenditure or even cutting expenditure if, if necessary. Um, we, we've talked about the the ideas behind forecasting. A bit of a starting point or a bit of a, a bit of a run through here, Mel, of, of some some points to consider when you're actively uh, setting out to forecast. Yeah, that's right, Chris. So really the point of forecasting is to try to understand what is going to happen. And that can be really challenging, particularly at the moment where there are so many question marks and a lot of the environment 
is really, really uncertain and unsettled. So it's good to think about the information that you know. Use that as a starting point. What can be relied upon? What do you know is going to happen? Then you can think about what you expect or what you think will happen. It would be really, really sensible and acting in the best interests of the charity to think about some different scenarios. So some what ifs and think about some of those what if scenarios and what that means for the finances of your charity. Sometimes it might help if you do some really short term forecasting. So it might be better for your organisation to do forecasting more regularly, but do it for a shorter period because you might not have any certainty about what's going to happen in 12 months time, but you might have some certainty about what's going to happen over the next three months or four months. So this might be a process that you need to repeat throughout this year. And you need to think about what happens if the charity doesn't receive some funding that it has received in the past. So I talked about donations. Your charity might be reliant on a very generous donation from a local business, for example. That business might not be operating at the moment, so they might not be in a position to continue that donation. So what does that mean for your charity without those funds? And also, again, the health restrictions. There might be reasons why your charity cannot undertake a particular program. And what does that mean? How will your charity either deliver it in a different way or perhaps your charity can't deliver that program at the moment? So I guess the process of forecasting, it should be useful and it should be practical and it should be realistic to help the charity make informed decisions about the path forward. Indeed. Now, we've got some different types of forecasting here. We'll, we'll, we'll mention them quickly here and I'll, I'll let you mention them, them quickly, Mel. Um, we've got a couple here listed. Uh, cash flow forecasting is one. Income and expenditure forecasting is the other. Um, very, I guess, quickly, Mel, what, what uh, I guess the, the definitions or what are the ideas behind these two types of forecasting? Sure. So cash flow forecasting is really about thinking and making sure about your cash flow. Are you going to have cash available when you need it? Or are you going to identify that you're going to have a shortage of cash at a particular point in time? So this is really helping the charity to provide any awareness or understand any warning signs to help avoid any future financial problems. So when you need cash, you need to make sure that the charity has cash at that time. And that's mm. really around the timing of when you're going to receive income or revenue and when you need to make payments. So you need to also think about when you need to pay a bill. When is the bill due? Are you going to have money in the bank at that time in order to make that payment? Yeah. Now, an income and expenditure forecast is slightly different because that's thinking about trying to understand and identify any potential revenue that you're going to get for the period or income and also thinking about the expenditure that you're expecting to incur within that period. So it might be a sensible scenario to think about, well, what if our income dropped by 10%, 20%, 30%? What is that going to mean for the charity? Now, a couple of points to remember. Forecasting is designed to give you information so that you can make informed decisions with some degree of certainty or a level of comfort that you're making the decisions that you need to make for the charity in the best interests of the charity. Yeah. It's also really important that responsible persons outline the key activities of the charity and are involved in the process. So it's a tool toward 
the viable the viable operation of the charity. So responsible persons are ultimately accountable. It's really important that they're involved in the process so that everyone has a shared understanding of why decisions are being made and what's expected to happen. Indeed. Um, and we, we touched on this point here um, just a couple of slides ago. Another part or another aspect towards this forecasting is even asking or considering the question um, on whether there is a need to change your charity's forecasting entirely to treat this period that we're in right now as a bit of an outlier and, and to put in place plans that you know, look to cover specifically maybe just the coming six months, um, nine months, 12 months, um, depending on what you're comfortable with. So keep that option in mind as well. Um, now, conservative forecasting, verging on perhaps worst case scenarios, using known information, scenarios and contingencies, all these sorts of things. In forecasting, we often, uh, I guess, start, or the most obvious point to start is, is factoring in income and, and things like fundraising, obviously, um, because of its direct uh, relationship to income. But we'll touch on fundraising and those sorts of issues in a second. There are also other things to consider as well. And, and one of these, as you can see on the screen right now, is, is fixed costs. Um, now, fixed costs, we're talking about things like rent and mortgage, uh, payments, loan repayments, uh, any technology agreements you might have security insurance, um, all of that sort of stuff. Now, what should charities be looking at when they're doing their forecasting in relation to fixed costs, Mel? Sure, so it's really, really trying to understand what your fixed costs are, whether there is any flexibility with those fixed costs, or whether they can be reduced, or they can be deferred, so they can be pushed out and paid later. And a couple of things you talked about there, Chris, in terms of rent or mortgage payments or loan repayments. So there might be an opportunity to be a bit flexible with making some of those payments. But uh, obviously you're going to need to have a talk to banks, lenders, perhaps your landlord, funders, or anyone else to see what conditions and arrangements are associated with all of those fixed costs and whether there is any flexibility to defer them or reduce them or come up with a different timetable for making those repayments. Yes. And if you're finding that certain arrangements are perhaps coming to an end, then you'll have to weigh up your options or consider organising further arrangements, for example. Now, that's that's forecasting in terms of fixed costs. Another aspect of forecasting here is, is, is staffing. Um, charities are likely to have to make decisions on staffing, uh, if they have staff. Uh, and, and I guess what we'll do is we'll perhaps uh, loop in volunteer numbers here as well. Um, as you move forward, decisions will, <clears throat> again, need to be made on, on things like staffing hours, um, uh, the financial impost of both staff and volunteers. Um, there's a couple of obvious ones that come straight to the straight to mind here. Um, does the charity need to stand down employees? Now, that's not something that we want to really consider, but it's something you're going to have to if you've got employees. What government assistance may there be to help us and, and our, our staff? Um, is there an opportunity to perhaps make use of some of those offers there? Um, but also, you know, there, there needs to be, I guess, a thought about is your charity able to operate your programs without some staff? Um, are there ways that you can maybe temporarily use volunteers rather than staff for certain tasks? Um, if so, does that mean that staff can be tasked with different things or can they have their hours reduced? Um, what are the impacts on staff and volunteers being unable to do their normal role due to, for example, um, family impacts, um, the ongoing, particularly in Victoria, remote learning arrangements that are uh, in place for school-aged children, um, the physical distancing that, that continues in some parts of the country. Um, and also there's obviously a consideration for leave entitlements too it may be appropriate to ask some staff to use some of their leave to reduce liabilities if their hours have been have been reduced, for example. Um, and we mentioned liabilities. Uh, Mel, if you wish to uh, speak a little bit further about some liabilities. Absolutely. 
So, I mean, ultimately liabilities are things that are owed. So if your charity owes any money, whether that's for rent or whether that's for um, a loan or a mortgage or anything like that, it's really, really important to look at whether there is any flexibility with these arrangements. And you've also got to think about any kind of agreements or restrictions or covenants that are in place in relation to all of these liabilities. You need to think about whether you can defer something, whether you can reduce it temporarily, or if you're lucky, you might be able to have a conversation about a particular liability and someone else might agree that the charity no longer has to pay that liability. And that might be a really, really practical and helpful way that your charity uh, can continue with a little bit more certainty. But I would suspect that that's probably not going to happen a lot of the time. Yeah. So yeah. also thinking about the timing of things. If you have got perhaps a lease that's coming up um, that's about to end, then you might still need the premises that fall under that lease. So it might be a good time to think about any renegotiation that needs to happen. But it's really important that you have the information available so that the RPs or the responsible persons for the charity can make informed decisions and be participants of informed discussions to think about what options are available for the charity. Most importantly, I think this dot point here, Chris, is that you've got to be able to have the conversation. Yeah, Some definitely. of the conversations might be really difficult and they might be very challenging, but you've got to think about what's in the best interest of the charity and you've got to be brave and have those conversations thinking about the charitable organisation and the purposes that the organisation undertakes. Absolutely spot on. Um, yeah, some of these conversations aren't going to be easy. Um, and, and there is an element of having to grit your teeth at times. Um, and, and you do need to do it. As a responsible person of a charity, you do need to do it. Um, clearly, as you can see on the screen, fundraising, um, there's been challenges uh, that, that many charities have, have felt. Um, we've seen charities that are relying on fundraising in a usual sort of face-to-face -face fundraising manager manner, uh, they've been very, very hard hit. Um, but even for those who aren't as reliant on this type of fundraising, there's been impacts, um, clearly. Um, you know, fundraising fundraising events have been have been cancelled or, or postponed. Um, there's a, a changed donations um, landscape, uh, obviously, upon us at the moment. Um, you know, the ability to just get out there and try and attract donations has become more challenging. Um, the difficulties of engaging supporters and donors um, ha have grown. Um, look, there's, again, there's no single simple answer uh, to addressing those challenges, I guess. But Mel, what, what are some of the things that charities should be doing and should perhaps continue to do? For sure. So I think it's important to note that the whole sector is having to, to change and navigate this uncertainty. So I think we need to actually acknowledge that we're all in this together and we're not alone. So mm -hmm. many charities have already started doing things a little bit different. And I think that point there around the new normal is, is really important because we don't know how long we're going to be in this environment for. So it's really important that charities start to take steps now so that they can put their organisations on a sustainable footing sooner rather than later, rather than waiting until the point where it is too late. So it's really important um, you know, to explore what can be done online what can be done in a virtual way rather than perhaps the normal of being in a face-to-face -face kind of environment. So it's really important uh, also, I think, to um, be flexible because some things might not work successfully. You might try something and it might be a terrible failure, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't stop trying something else. So mm. I think there needs to be an acknowledgement that the organisations that you're all working as part of, there needs to be a bit of flexibility. And what works for your charity might not work 
for someone else's charity. So you might see an idea from another organisation and you might think that's a great way to do something, but it might not be appropriate for your particular organisation. So I think having an awareness of different options and having different options to think about and select from is really, really healthy. But there just needs to be perhaps an understanding that you need to think about your particular charity, what's in the best interest of your organisation, because some things might be more appropriate than others. And in that in that context of thinking about what might be best for your charity, um, there's obviously some options here. We we discussed the online fundraising platforms um, and, yeah. and some of the, uh, ability and availability of those options. Um, a number of charities, a number of organisations as a whole, um, you know, uh, are holding virtual events, uh, virtual fundraisers. Um, I won't say remote fundraisers, that, that doesn't sound so good, but virtual events and those sorts of things. Um, y y the use of technology and the, and the, the connection online, um, uh, these sorts of options are, are, are there and they're available and they're ones that clearly a charity should be looking at, should be considering and seeing if they are right for your charity. Obviously, too, if you are doing these sorts of things, you're getting online, you need to remember your, your permits, uh, fundraising permits, um, obviously fundraising regulation online, um, you need to be thinking about your licences and permits and uh, and the things like that that you, that you might need. When we talk about the fundraising challenges, you know, we might also have to talk about a deeper look at your strategy. Um, do you need to review your overall fundraising strategy? Um, do you need to review it so that you be, it better reflects the challenges and, and the changes in the fundraising landscape that, that are, are currently affecting, I guess, your charity and, and the entire sector? Um, when, when we look towards, I guess, doing that, um, Mel, what are like maybe a couple of things, a couple of very quick things that, that charities should think about if they're looking to review the fundraising strategy? Absolutely. So I think this is where it ties back nicely to forecasting. So yeah. how your charity is going to receive any funds or any goods that it needs in order to service your beneficiaries and run your programs that's going to that's sort of going to impact on that forecasting process so you need to think about how you might do things differently and what the flow and effects are for your organization in terms of the the money or the goods that it receives in order to keep you know providing those to beneficiaries or or running programs so mm. they are linked and also the, um, I guess the forecasting process can perhaps influence what your strategy is for fundraising if it's identified that particular strategies would be better uh, in a particular environment or at a particular point in time. Um, yeah. So they are linked and they need to coexist and they need to support each other so that the charity has information that helps responsible persons make good decisions. And when it comes to these sorts of decisions, the strategies and, and the forecasting, uh, one thing that is very important to, to remember <clears throat> is, is the need to continue to communicate with, with your people, with your supporters, your donors, members, staff, volunteers. Um, when you're making decisions about charity money and, and fundraising, clear communication has to be key. Um, now that we're going to touch on meetings a little bit um, later in this webinar, we'll, we'll quickly uh, go through that. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, one way that your charity can, can communicate. But, you know, obviously you should be looking to harness all manner of communication methods and channels. Um, yeah, your website, your social media, perhaps um, if you have a regular, um, you know, uh, e-newsletter or, or publication that comes out. Um, if you have the desire or the ability to put together a podcast, for example, maybe you can do that with you know, a senior person at your charity or interview with a, a charity leader, uh, for example. Um, communication provides your, your people with the information uh, they need. It keeps them informed and updated and allows you to get your messages across. This communication, um, 
it's, it's while it's important for issues that are linked to charity fundraising, um, of course, should be a key uh, consideration uh, on a wider scale, um, on a more general level as well. Um, now, we'll verge from communication to collaboration, which is a nice bit of alliteration. Charities should really continue to seek out opportunities to collaborate. Uh, that's to consider shared resources or other shared effort, efforts that may reduce cost or, or may increase the work efficiency. Um, collaboration may mean different things to different charities, of course, but there are quite a few ways to pursue collaboration. Um, one really simple way is to share information and experiences. Um, speaking to other charities and people, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences, um, reaching out and asking and talking. Uh, again, as, as Mel said earlier, we're, we're all in this one together. Um, what, are, what are some of the other, um, I guess, considerations here, Mel? Absolutely. So it's really important to take some time to assess what the benefit would be from collaboration. So will your charity actually get a benefit from working with another organisation or another charity? So if you actually start by uh, perhaps speaking to another charity or another organisation to better understand what each organisation is doing um, to avoid duplication, for example. But sharing knowledge, best practice and learning from each other can be really helpful and give you some really key information that you can use within your charitable organisation. Would it be better to work alone and continue to service your beneficiaries independently alone? Or would it be better to work together? Would it be better to work with a charity that does something similar to your charity? Or is there any benefit in working with a charity that does something completely different because you can perhaps share resources, um, mm. for example? But I think it's really important to have a conversation, ask questions and get a better understanding on whether you can work together to raise funds, to reduce costs, to share any burdens or any overheads or yeah. anything like that. So there are ways and means of collaboration and it could, it could be very different for very different organisations. Now there was um, also, we'll make a quick mention of this, um, an article uh, on, on Pro Bono Australia's website um, last month that looked at this issue. If you want to want to the website there, it's, it was called Has COVID-19 Accelerated Funding Collaboration? Um, again, we'll link to it in our um, follow-up email and also in the handout that you, you'll have, uh, ha have access to. It's well worth a read and, and well worth a look. Um, so maybe wander and, and have a look. Um, Charity reserves is uh, another uh, another issue um, and has, has uh, an issue that's come up repeatedly over the last little while. Um, you know, charity reserves, if you're lucky to have, uh, lucky enough to have money set aside for a rainy day, um, spare money if there can ever be such a thing, um, it's tempting to perhaps think about accessing it in times like this. Um, there might also be things, however, to be mindful of. And, and again, if your charity is in a position where they have reserves, um, Mel, what do you believe that they should perhaps keep in mind? Absolutely. Well, you just mentioned, you know, that some organisations are lucky enough to have money for a rainy day or funds set aside for a rainy day. I think it's fair to say that it's raining at the moment right across yeah. Australia and in many parts of the world. So if your organisation does have any funds held in reserve, you need to think about whether they have been kept aside for a specific reason. So your charitable organisation might have funds set aside for a specific purpose or there could be conditions attached. So you need to think about whether you have got the ability to make decisions to use those funds or whether those funds are essentially out of bounds and they can't be used for the rainy day um, that we're currently experiencing. So also have a think about whether your organisation has any policy. Do you have any agreement on how reserves are going to be used? What amount of reserves you're happy 
to use at a particular point in time. As I said earlier, it's really important to make any decisions and document them so that everyone is in agreement and if anyone needs to look at the decisions that have been made, they are able to find evidence of those decisions being made. And back to what you were saying earlier, Chris, around communication, it's really important that if you're making decisions, then it's important to communicate those decisions to stakeholders, donors, people that might be giving your charitable organisation the funds that it needs to undertake its programs. Make sure they're informed. Make sure the public are informed. Make sure any members are informed. Anyone who's involved with the charity should be aware of how those funds are being used and why they're being used at the moment. And I think also the last point, any flow on impacts. It's important to think that or, or, or to recognise that if you have funds set aside, if you spend them now for a particular reason, they aren't available in the future mm. for perhaps the reason that you might have been setting aside those reserves in the first place. So I guess it's important to realise that when you're when you're talking about the flow and impact again we look back at things like forecasting and things like budgeting and 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 those sorts of things being able to look a little bit into the future um now another again another aspect when it comes to charity money here is, is funding arrangements uh, and agreements um maybe grants uh, projects that are part of an agreement with a funder um, this is something charities will have already, a lot of charities might have already moved on. Um, you know, chatting about these sorts of projects uh, funded by others with, with those who they're working with. Um, now, if those projects are up in the air, you know, being held over, delayed, um, those sorts of things, it's important to have, again, that conversation with the people who you need to talk to, um, to just make sure that the, I guess the message gets across, particularly if you're worried that your that your charity might not be able to hold up its its end of the commitment. Um, yeah. So yeah, talking talking and and holding those conversations again uh, is vital. Absolutely. So charities need to think about whether their priorities have changed. And for many charities, going through COVID and the current environment, following the bushfires and drought, many charities have changed what they want to do in the immediate short term and also in the, the medium to longer term. So it's really important to think about what is the purpose of your organisation, what is its mission and what is its strategy and make decisions about what can still be delivered in terms of programs. Importantly, talk to anyone who is funding your organisation and potentially if you need to think about changes then discuss alternatives. There might be a delay to a particular project or a project may need to be changed so it may need to look a little bit different. So does that mean that any grant agreements need to be adjusted? The timelines need to be changed? Milestones? Any outcomes that have been agreed? or key performance indicators, or payment schedules, does anything need to change in any of those areas? And I think it's also important to, to talk about uh, potential extensions to grant agreements to provide the charity with certainty if that will help the organisation, or if you've been given a grant for a particular reason but you haven't spent it all, does that mean that those unspent funds can be kept or can be rolled over into a future period or used for another reason? So all of these things uh, are really important for charities to start thinking about. And there's a really useful piece on the Smarty Grants site, which is called Grant Making in a COVID-19 World. Uh, and that's aimed at grant makers, but it still does contain some useful information to grantees as well. We'll include a, a link to that uh, that piece too. Uh, again, in our handouts and in the the follow up email, so that you've got um, you've got a link to it and you can have a read. It's well worth having a read. Um, 
Now, government stimulus and financial reporting considerations. I'm having a look at my clock and we've gone, we've only got 10 or so minutes. So my goodness, I've forgotten how quickly some of these uh, webinars can go. But look, on these topics, there's been a number of obviously stimulus uh, and, and support uh, measures being put in place. Uh, again, there's a good rundown on our, on our COVID page, uh, particularly when it comes to ones from the government. The ATO website, uh, the tax office website, has a lot of information available too, um, as do websites from state and territory governments. But if your charity has been receiving some benefit or stimulus, one of the or one of the packages from the government, perhaps, um, it, it may be reaching a time where some of these measures are wrapping up. Now, if that's the case, um, we probably need to be a little bit mindful of some of those things. What are perhaps some of the examples, Mel, just quickly, of a couple of them that might be wrapping up very soon? Sure. So the, the one that everyone is probably aware of is JobKeeper. So yeah. that's currently scheduled to finish on the 27th of September. There's also some safe harbour provisions that were introduced by government relating to insolvent trading for companies limited by guarantee. But the ACNC has made a statement that it will apply those principles to all registered charities. That finishes on the 25th of September. So it's really starting to think about the end dates for these things and what that means for the charity. Now we know that the government is going to make announcements about some of these programs. We haven't yet heard those announcements, but mm. you need to start thinking about what will happen if they do end. A key thing here, I guess, too, is to um, to be realistic, isn't it, Mel, to, to perhaps, again, start having the talks with the people you need to talk to. Absolutely. So if you've got an accountant, if you're lucky enough to have the expertise of someone or any professional who provides advice, make sure that you're asking questions and starting to plan for these potential outcomes now so that your charity is informed and in a good position to respond accordingly. Yeah. Um, now, financial reporting uh, considerations here as well. There are um, some, some end dates coming up on a couple of requirements related to reporting to the ACNC. Um, one of them, obviously, as you probably know about, is uh, the extension to charities uh, annual information statement lodgements. Um, for the 2019 AIS, that extension is, uh, is runs till the 31st of August. Um, now, there's also uh, relief for the governance standards and ECS that ends on September the 30th, uh, September the 30th, September the 30th. Um, so responsible persons, again, need to be aware of these things. Um, what, what else? What else do we have there, Mel? Absolutely. So it's really making sure that responsible persons and all directors start to think about their charities operations and the going concern basis for financial statements. Now that's a, an accounting term, which I won't go into now, but really what that means is when your organisation prepares financial statements, the default position is that those financial statements are prepared on the basis that the organisation is going to continue for a further 12 month period. So if there is any reason that the organisation uh, will not continue because of particular uncertainty, then that needs to be disclosed in the financial statements. If your charity has been receiving any government stimulus payments or packages, then be open about that. Be transparent and disclose that in the financial statements. And if COVID-19 has had a really big impact on your operations, or uh, has really affected the charity, again, disclose that and be transparent so that anyone looking at your financial statements can be quickly made aware of how that impact has affected your organisation. It's really important, again, if you use reserves, explain that in the financial statements and make sure that members or any other important stakeholders that, that uh, support your charity, make sure they're aware of the financial statements, make sure that they have an opportunity to ask questions and document and capture any decision making. Yeah, definitely. We also, we look at 
and there's some little points here on the screen too, um, issues around the preparation of charity financial statements. Um, the responsible persons declaration, um, you know, uh, that there needs to be the, the proper declaration of anything that might be important to the reader of any financial statements um, that should be disclosed. Um, responsible persons also reminded that they will need to sign off on a solvency declaration when submitting to the ACNC at the same time that they are able to, uh, at the same time, so that we, we know and they know and, and they, they say that they can pay off their debts uh, when they're due and when they're payable. Again, as a reminder, um, charities should be looking to refer to the ACNC's COVID page again, um, uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash COVID-19. Um, now, we'll, we'll whiz through this. Meetings and AGMs, another very obvious, very practical way that, that um, charity operations have been affected by um, <clears throat> by what's been going on here and, and around the world. Um, one thing one thing that is, is clear is that there are many organisations who are holding meetings very differently to how they may have held them even six months ago. Um, the way we've experienced meetings over the past few months has changed uh, with you know the use of Skype, Zoom, Teams, those sorts of things. That's increased greatly. Uh, it's been a very tangible way we've felt the impacts of physical distancing due to COVID-19. Lots of charities and not-for-profit groups are preparing to approach you know, their AGMs um, and the changed way we stage meetings uh, will again become very relevant to them. Um, the rules and regulations surrounding the ability to hold meetings and AGMs using technology have, have changed in, in many respects. They've changed to allow greater flexibility in online or, or tech dependent meetings. Um, again, more info on that on the, on the COVID page. Um, but when it comes to holding meetings remotely and, and even AGMs remotely, Mel, what are maybe some very quick tips that, that we, would, we would have for charities? Sure. So if it's more efficient to use technology to run a meeting virtually, then think about how that can be incorporated going forward. So can virtual meetings work? Um, are they better? And what, if any, operations can be maintained online? But be aware that if, for example, you're an incorporated association, then you need to make sure you're aware of what your state or territory requirements are. Some jurisdictions have changed and as you said, have provided a bit more flexibility, but some haven't necessarily provided that flexibility. So it's really important that you understand what applies to your particular charity. Yeah, and look, there's a very, very good resource that we've recently put together that's up on the ACNC website um, on, on virtual meetings or, or remote meetings, um, as they're called. It's uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash remote meetings. Um, we'll definitely take a look at that. That's well worth a read. Uh, a very informative, very, very handy resource. Um, a few more practical points here, I guess, when it comes to actually staging the meetings. Um, ensure everyone can connect uh, and properly communicate. Uh, speaking and listening, communication flows both ways. Ensure members are allowed the opportunity to ask questions, particularly at AGMs. Um, it can be a really good idea to organise for something as simple as a test meeting um, or, or for people to connect early um, if you're meeting virtually uh, or remotely for the first time. Um, this can be a very practical way to ensure that everyone's able to connect and everyone's able to, to hear and, and to speak. Um, Ensure you have uh, people have access to the key documents, um, including you know financials, um, agendas, uh, meeting minutes, all of those sorts of things. If there are votes needing to be staged as well, ensure these are done clearly, easily, and transparently. There are apps, there are um, ways of doing those those online. Um, a suggestion would be to have a, a bit of a look around the internet, or again talk to fellow charities um, to get a little bit more information about perhaps what they've used. Um, there are definite options there though. So, final little bit, record keeping. Again, if we're doing forecasting and financials and all of that sort of stuff, record keeping of course comes into uh, comes into play again. Charities are of course obliged to keep records. Uh, record keeping is, is vital right now, um, particularly when it comes to documenting your charity's decisions and uh, where it's going with its finances. The first key thing to remember here is that record keeping doesn't just mean having printed files and it doesn't mean that you only have printed files. Electronic record keeping is fine, isn't it Mel? Absolutely. 
So it's really important, whatever way your charity decides to document decisions, whether that's electronic, paper, virtually, whatever it is, it's really important that it is done well. And it's a sign of good overall charity gov governance. And also, it's really important, a reminder that charities need to document where there are changes to their responsible persons. So a quick plug that that can be done through the ACNC charity portal. Yeah, indeed. Um, now, we've got about four or five quick tips that we'll we'll run through just before we uh, we finish things up. Um, thank you to everyone for hanging online. We know we've hit our one o'clock deadline. We've got about two minutes ahead of us. So thank you again. Um, what we'll what we'll do, our top tips, First top tip, the best interest of your charity um, in line with its purposes and, and its governing document. It's a key thing for responsible persons to remember when they're making decisions, when they're forecasting uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, the second tip is that financial forecasting needs to be realistic. And as we mentioned earlier on, as Mel mentioned earlier on, perhaps verging on the conservative and maybe worst case scenarios need to be, need to be considered as well. What are our next two tips here, Mel? Does your fundraising strategy and your activities fit the new normal? So think about changes that you need to make for your organisation to navigate the changes that we've seen in our current environment. Thinking about collaboration, can you work with any other charity, any other funders or any other organisations to improve your charity's operations, to get better efficiencies or to learn new ways of doing things? Yeah. And the fifth tip that we've got here regarding meetings and the decision making process is ensure that they're accessible, um, ensure that they're, uh, the decisions are made transparently and, and recorded properly. Um, re again, record keeping is, is, vital, uh, is vital here. Now, we were going to have questions, but I've subtly skipped over that one because we're almost out of time. So what we'll do is we'll wrap up. Um, we'll wrap up here. Um, Again, just a reminder that the recording of this webinar, the slides, web links, and other relevant stuff, it's going to be up on the website in the coming days. We'll also get a, a, an email out to everyone who registered so that they can um, they can read the articles that we've mentioned and go to the very you know the various relevant pages that we're got up on our website. Um, what what we uh, what we'll also do is we'll um, we'll have a recording, obviously, of the uh, webinar up uh, on the ACNC uh, website. Uh, as quickly as possible. You could be able to access that through um, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars, that this most least recent one and all of our ones in the past as well. Um, as you can see, these are other ways you can stay in touch with us. Um, no doubt new e-monthly the charitable purpose um, you know, that contains a lot of good information, news, resources uh, and the regular commissioners column as well. So well worth a look. Um, Finally, before we go, a, a, a big virtual remote thank you to everyone who has attended today and a big virtual remote thank you to, to Mel. Uh, thank you very much, Mel. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you to Maggie and to Matt who have been typing away madly in the background answering people's questions. I um, hope that you've enjoyed our presentation today. Um, thank you very much for coming along. Uh, it's been great to be back and doing this again. Uh, we look forward to you joining us uh, again in the near future. Have a great day, everyone, and, and look, stay safe, most importantly as well. See you later.